Okay, so uh, what we're going to talk about today, let's let's maybe just go through a, a diagram of what really is the landscape right now with edge-based computer vision and, and why it's actually such an exciting place to be. Uh, in, in particular, what's, what's happening in the world is this explosion of the AI, AI adoption. So uh, one of the, the real trends here in 2020 is this concept of AI adoption. And if you think about things that are like a pandemic, for example, really what they are is they're an accelerant. So there already was a emerging um, trend where you know you have AI and you have machine learning and you have cloud computing and, and all these things were kind of already happening. And then we had a random event. And so the random event was that there was a, a pandemic and the pandemic is really just kind of like a wind almost like a it's like a we'll just say this is a the, the wind of of covid-19 and it's and it's it's really making many companies government organizations think about how do i do more ai adoption and in particular one of the ways that they can do this is with using things like no code and a lot of this class actually is designed to be a no-code or a low-code solution. And why is this so important is that many government organizations, large companies, they think about AI as like a, a robot or Terminator or maybe something that's very unrealistic. But in terms of really the adoption of AI, if you can get people to think about how to do these problems on their own, they're going to be much more open to getting AI into their into their organization. And this this is really, I think, one of the key problems with why companies haven't done AI is that they they feel like it's too complex. So the the stuff that we've covered in this course really is uh, an important type of of AI programming and this AutoML component is really a critical piece. So uh, with AutoML, uh, the idea is that many problems really can be filtered into the concept of, I need data, and so this is my, our first piece, and, and then I just need to put the data into the right uh, framework. And, and there are many emerging frameworks that allow you to do no code training. And so with AutoML, it's very conducive to the no code environment. No, no code is actually, it's, it's kind of primary purpose. And so if I can just go to a regular person, maybe these are some you know regular business people, and all they have to do is just upload this data in, into some system, and then they can you know, maybe click a button Right here, the button says go. And, and then the framework can go through and give a machine learning model result out. And we'll call this the model. Th that makes it much easier for companies to adopt computer vision, adopt uh, AI. So even though it's not as complicated to do AutoML, it doesn't mean that it's not as valuable. And in fact, this is really an important distinction to be made is that the uh, complexity of something isn't directly proportional uh, to the business value. They're, they're, they're basically two different things, right? Just because something is easy doesn't mean that um, it's not valuable to, to an organization. So we can just say that they're, they're, they're not, you know, they're, they're not related. It, there could be some things that are very complex that have high business value, but there's also things that are low complexity that, that high, have high business value. And, and in fact, one of the ways that, that an organization could, could think about how to implement AI is to think about maybe some non-technical components uh, in, in their organization. And, and hopefully, when you're able to go through and look at these automobile solutions, you can think about this, is that what are the real problems, technical problems, in, in an organization. 
uh, and, and typically the, t the kind of technical problems are, are actually mostly cultural problems. And by cultural problems, this could mean that they, uh, let's, let's just describe some of them. One problem that organizations have is they don't use agile methodology. Uh, and we'll get into that in a second. But, uh, you know, agile methodology, it doesn't exist. Uh, another technical problem that some organizations have is that they're not focused on uh, a profit. So, so they may be funded by venture capital funds and, and, the, and they actually don't care about making money. Uh, another problem uh, is that they, they may feel like uh, AI is too complex. AI is complicated. So what, one of the ways that you can fix these things is by kind of getting into the culture of a company and, and fixing these, these, these kinds of, of problems. And so one way of, of fixing these problems is to go back to the uh, Japanese um, auto industry and to look at something called Kaizen. And so what is Kaizen? So Kaizen is a process of continuous improvement. So you, you, you basically have, you know, somebody that is maybe they, they can do uh, three, three push-ups, right? This would be a, a Kaizen methodology, one, two, three. And then the next day, this is on a Monday. And then on a Tuesday, they want to go through and they want to do another, um, they want to do five push-ups, right? And this is Tuesday and then this is Wednesday. They want to go through and they want to do, you know, 10, 10, 10 push-ups. So the, the idea here is that you have, you have continuous improvement. And, and one of the ways that you can have this continuous improvement is by, by using methodologies that are, that are lower complexity. And so uh, if your methodology has low, low complexity... Here we go. The complexity is low, then it's easy to continuously improve, right? Because uh, when the when the complexity is 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 very very low, you you're able to actually rapidly make changes, right? If if all you're doing is something like a push up, well, it's it's easy to think about what it is that you're building. Uh, on the flip side, if you're doing something really complex like deep learning or or, or another system, uh, it could be it could be really challenging. So these are just a few things to to kind of think about when you're when you're building uh, a uh, machine learning system. Is this concept of kaizen? How do I continuously improve my my model, uh, and how how can I actually do it in a in a low complexity way? And and this is really the origins of of, of agile programming. If you if you look at um, the the agile programming methodology it has a lot in common with the w some of the things they discovered in the in the Japanese automobile industry and it even goes into the origins of kaizen which we can get into in a second which in the or origins of kaizen start with the, something called the five whys and a lot of time a lot of times when you look at something called the five whys it's a good way to identify the root cause of a problem. So a lot of, a lot of times, somebody in a company might say, um, you may want to ask a question. Like the qu first question would be, uh, why don't we do computer vision? Why don't we use computer vision? And then the answer might be something like, uh, you know. It, it, it is uh, t too much code, too much code, too much complexity, right? So, so then maybe what you say is, well, I guess we could call this the, the answer here. So we'll just call this the answer. And then if I go to two, well, could we use no code? And, and then you start to dig into it, and it turns out that someone could say, uh, maybe, right? Maybe, maybe I could use uh, no code. Well, and then, and then next one is how could we use uh, no code? 
right? And I, and I won't go through all of these different um, questions here, but but what's great about this kind of thinking is that it, it helps you kind of dig into the cultural reasons of like why why is it that your organization is not doing computer vision, uh, and what it may the answer may be is that people think that they associate deep deep learning, TensorFlow, all of the software development, but it turns out that in fact many of uh, the projects are actually done with with no code in a in a computer vision class that I teach. So let, let's go and and let's let's kind of think about this methodology when we're when we're diving into some of the concepts that we covered before. So now let's go and uh, look at that in the in this mindset here. So if I go to computer vision here and pull this in, and I go to this first lecture. One of the things that we covered in our first lecture was just the, the lay of the land and uh, some of the, the core concepts that are happening in, in terms of, of, of hardware. We know that the CPU itself is really uh, at its end, right? We know that the CPU uh, is not getting faster. And so the end result is that people are using other methodologies like uh, a GPU, they're using a TPU, uh, and it's also opened up many real opportunities for edge-based computer vision. We also know that the Omdel's law problem of even in the case of having massive parallel uh, systems, that unless your code is is really uh, optimized for being parallel, then there's going to be a, a huge problem in terms of of um, uh, of getting that performance boost. So the answer is that many companies have dove into their their own chips. A good example is the TPU that came out of Google. Uh, a CPU is designed to be really something that's not a parallel processing machine. A GPU is much more parallel. Um, and a TPU, which is a, a customized chip, which we know, know runs on you know, even very tiny systems like you know these these um, edge-based accelerators. They're, they're they're actually designed to be specifically used in a computer vision problem. So, on one hand, the the problem itself has has actually created a new solution. We also know these other companies like Amazon, uh, Nvidia, AMD, Intel. These are all players that are that are building their own chips. Uh, there's also customized solutions like an FPGA that could be used. So. Even though there's a there's a crisis in in terms of CPU, it's opened up an opportunity for for really innovation in these these um, specialized chips. And in the case of something like an FPGA, the the big takeaway is that it, a CPU is really one core. Uh, a GPU in this particular example is about three thousand cores, but then an FPGA can have you know maybe two million. Uh, of these kinds of cells, so you can see that it's it's extremely dense. So there are are these specialized solutions that weren't really highly thought a, thought after or or used that now are becoming really mainstream, like a GPU and FPGA, because of the fact that the CPU really is not the the right answer for many problems. Probably the biggest story recently in the customized chip space is Apple. They made the announcement that they're not only uh, going to continue to do work where they build neural network hardware in their phones, but they're actually designing their own chips now. They're dropping the Intel chip and they're, they're building their own chips. So essentially the large companies are, are building a vertically integrated AI system. And, and this also goes again back to the, the Kaizen you know, approach where uh, in, in terms of a vertically integrated uh, company, they're going to control the stack. So let's let's maybe just talk about that real quick as well about vertically integrated AI. If you if you talk about vertically integrated AI, it really does show some of the things that are occurring in this in this um, computer vision space. So vertical integration. What is interesting about it is that it has this, I guess. On the side, we have this concept of Kaizen, right? Which is every day things are improving, 
you know, may, you know, improve whatever I'm doing every day. So how could I improve if I'm a company like, let's just take uh, maybe Google. Google's a good company. We'll take Google. How, how do they practice Kaizen to build vertically integrated um, AI? Well, what they can do is... Sorry, we, I don't know how to help with that. Here are other we know we have the cloud right here. So here's a cloud. We also know that we have uh, a, a framework. So they have the TensorFlow framework. Uh, they also have the chip, right? So they have the, the TPU chip. We also know that they have the uh, user data. So we could put this up over here. They have you know, things like Gmail, they have search data. Uh, they also have the um, the phone, so they have an Android phone. So, so what does all this mean? Is that uh, they're 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 continuously building a stack, and then in the terms of the framework, they're building out things like the AutoML solutions. Is that they're they're constantly thinking about how do I improve, right? How do I how do I more deeply integrate all of these different components to, to make them better? So how do I make the framework better, TensorFlow framework? How do I make the chip better? How do I make the phone better? How do I make the, the, the um, computer vision better? And the emergent property of this is that you have things like no code uh, computer vision, uh, no code computer vision. So. This is really a huge opportunity right now for people is that being able to write no code computer vision models can be really a strong business skill because you can focus on leveraging the power of these companies that are doing vertically integrated AI and also focusing on the business problem. So Apple is another one that does the same thing. I talked about this, TPUs, R1, ADBOS Inferentia, uh, Elastic Inference, but in general, the, 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 big, the big trend here is emerging hardware AI and managed platforms. And not only that, but these companies also build out the, the frameworks inside of a, a managed machine learning platform like SageMaker, or Google has AI platform, or BigQuery, for example, the Google BigQuery system can actually do machine learning right inside of uh, the SQL uh, system. So maybe we'll just talk about that real quick. Some of the things here, again, you can see uh, the, uh, the this um, deep lens device uh, is also a fully integrated system. Uh, there's development boards that allow you to go through and build um, integrated solutions like this uh, Azure development board. Um, you also have uh, edge-based devices that we've, we talked about previously that are, that are also built into this whole ecosystem that's constantly evolving. And when you're looking at something like that's a low-code or no-code solution, the, the big uh, advantage of that is that you can take advantage of all these trends that are happening without you having to necessarily know everything about them. 5G, uh, they're available offline. They have very good privacy characteristics, and they're using these cutting-edge chips. Some of the examples of these devices are Deep Lens, the Intel Neural Compute Stick, Raspberry Pi, uh, NVIDIA, iOS, and in particular, probably you know two of the the best stand standalone uh, examples would be the uh, Movidius chip, which you can download pre-trained models and run them on very performant hardware. Um, and this goes through and shows you how to do that. The other one uh, is, I think, as I mentioned earlier, a really powerful uh, you know, tool to use in, in building quick solutions or no-code solutions or low-code solutions is, is this iOS CoreML uh, ecosystem. And in particular, what's great about it is they've got their own hardware. It's optimized for that particular hardware. There's minimal memory footprint, and you can actually take a model that was trained in the cloud. Maybe it was trained with the Google Cloud or was trained with maybe Azure or somewhere else, and you can convert those 
into this CoreML model. So, so they're really open to other people taking their code. But the, a key design characteristic is that they're designing their system to be uh, very high privacy so that a, a lot of the privacy issues uh, are, are, are not prevalent that you would get in, let's say, other companies. And then to convert those models, the big takeaway is that you can use something like CoreML tools and you can convert a model from, let's say, cafe to some other a section. And here's how you do it. I would say, you know, import CoreML tools, for example, if I needed to, and I could look at all the different converters uh, on there. And then when you're going to install uh, a new model in something like the uh, Xcode X SDK, you can see it's almost like an image file or a video file or something like that. You just put the, the model inside, it knows how to use it. So this is probably the other trend that's gonna happen 2020, 2021, is that most software engineers are going to be doing machine learning and they're gonna be treating machine learning models like other assets. Uh, you, you've seen this before where people are doing you know, uh, things with video or doing things with images and those used to be a big deal. It's like, well, you know, this person's using images, but the ML model will just be another asset. And a lot of times the ML model will be using an approach like we've used, which is you use a no code solution to, to build it. And then you can just upgrade the existing application to do better predictions based on either somebody else's model that you copied or your own model that you've enhanced. And then really to wrap up this section, uh, the, the main takeaway is that I think it's important to think about this concept of the Russian dolls where you have at the, at the highest level, um, you know, some, something where you would call an API, but the lowest level, you have something where you're using all of the, the code yourself. And in many cases, I think, one of the issues that that people are having with something like TensorFlow is that it's the lowest level doll, right? It's the smallest level of abstraction. And, and, and as you can see here, that really that level of depth is probably not necessary. Uh, and, you know, if you, if you go through some of these examples here, you can see there's really probably two too much uh, detail for, for most people, maybe 80% of the people that are doing computer vision. Now there are other higher level tools like Keras, which make it a little bit better, right? Where you can see there's you know much smaller, a bit of code here, uh, but but that might be a better solution is for, for most people to, to kind of focus on something like Keras. But there are other tools uh, that, that are no code at all. And, and this, this is, or, or this would be a combination of low code, no code, which is Ludwig. And, and really the idea here is that you can uh, basically put a config file together. The config file has the input, it has the output, and, and you go through and you run it um, to, uh, to train a model automatically. And in fact, the um, Ludwig itself, um, I know that th they're still doing a lot of active development on it. and. What, what is really great about this kind of a example here is just that I could train someone who's, who really doesn't have strong software engineering skills, but does have a strong business understanding of a problem they're trying to solve. And, and really they would just need to know how to have a image path, also to have uh, the classes identified, and then they would put in what their model definition YAML would look like. In this case, the input features, you know, name, type, encoder, um, and then it basically put this inside uh, of a command line tool and then go through and train that, that model. So there's an example I think that would be a good one to go through if you have some time to, to go through and, and run uh, this um, example uh, AutoML and see how it actually works without you needing to use even a proprietary system. And, and I think that, that really the demand for this kind of um, computer vision skills is very high, that most organizations, as I talked about earlier, have not adopted the AutoML, computer vision, AI, ML, 
and so one of the ways you can get companies to to kind of adopt this is to to use these uh, low code uh, tools here. Um, another example of this abstraction here uh, is that things like AutoML from GCP, which which uh, is a re recommended um, way to solve problems, uh, and what I like about the Google AutoML solution is that it really does let you focus on solving the problem and identifying a business problem. And really, you need to just upload the data set, go into the AutoML system. It trains it on specialized hardware. You can either deploy it to your own local device uh, or you can actually uh, have it be an online model and, and you can download it. And let's just talk about this real quick. Let's just look at it real quick again to just recap uh, some of the things about Google AutoML. So if I go to the console here, the, the main takeaways for the Google Cloud are that uh, once you've actually trained or, or uploaded the model, you, you get a lot of useful tools for business uh, let's go computer vision, or I'll just say auto ML. Let's say auto ML. There we go, auto ML. And we go to auto ML vision. And if we look at, let's say, a data set here, the just by uploading the data, uh, I can start working with the product manager in a company identifying how how well our data fits or you know looking at other things uh, and then I also can go through and look at the model that's been trained and and also go through and, and look at all of these great graphs right that, that show me things about you know um, what the uh, prediction accuracy is and and also even uh, look visually and see which ones are the true positives and look at the false negatives, you know, just basically look through visually at the data. So maybe later someone would want to tune this themselves using their own software tools. But I, my suspicion is that many organizations will lean towards these types of tools for building um, AutoML solutions because of, of how much they enhance the productivity right and and it, it really gets into focusing more on the business problem you're solving versus solving uh something that really maybe is technically good but doesn't solve a problem also because they have this easy way to go down and export the model to other locations like uh, tf light which exports it to mobile devices uh, tensorflow javascript which exports it to the browser and then core ml which exports a ml model to run on ios or mac os uh, or container or coral these are all great solutions here that come out of this auto ml uh, example and and it it may not be quick enough to for someone to actually do all of this you know based on the business problem that a software engineer is is confronted with or a or a business analytics person is confronted with, it may not be fast enough to do all this yourself. The only way you can approach the speed that your organization needs is by using something that has all these built-in hooks in, inside of it. And in particular, this is one of the ones I think that's one of the most fascinating, um, is this emerging marketplace for uh, things like TPUs. And look at the answer here says, helping you bring local AI to applications from prototype to production. So local AI means that you can actually use it in, in many situations that don't work well, right? Um, so you may need a very specialized um, power, uh, maybe you want to identify multiple kinds of faces, uh, or you have a small form factor, right? So you have something that's really tiny that needs to be placed somewhere. And in particular, what what's nice about this is the the if you look at the the smaller form factor here that this you know 10 millimeter by 15 millimeter tpu um, could be soldered onto an existing uh, board uh, it can do it to very powerful uh, predictions without using a lot of energy and it fits 
very well with the AutoML workflow. So someone could be more focused on solving the business problem and, and, and focusing on getting it right. So doing Kaizen, right? There's just, are we making things better? Are we making things better? Are we making things better? If you're not focused on, on this agile component of it, instead you're taking a long time to, to develop things. You're really uh, maybe hurting your company or, or in some cases solving the wrong problem. And so let me, let me also talk about that real quick about this feedback loop and why it's so important that that one of the core components of building software, a lot of my career I, I've been focused on building uh, software. So some of the things I've built are mobile apps, you know, software as a service apps, games, films, and and the, the, the core, some of the core concepts is like, how do you actually, how do you build something that somebody wants, right? So so what's the, what's the actual process of Agile? And one of the, the core um, components of, of Agile is this concept of a weekly demo. And this is why I ask students to do demos, is that uh, a weekly demo is greater than the ticket system. So many of the companies that I've been involved in where they hired me to fix their company, they, they would have um, very good ticket systems. So let's just maybe draw a ticket system here and they have you know, all kinds of tickets everywhere. They have maybe a manager that's going through, he's saying all these things. But, but the tickets, really, this is, um, I would call this fiction, right? So someone could, could, could say whatever they want in a ticket. They could say, yeah, I have a ticket to build a mobile app. I have a ticket to build a, you know, I have a ticket to do this. But that doesn't mean anything. You could have 14 people who are project managers and we'll call them PMs and, and, and still doesn't mean anything. But this is truth, right? So the weekly demo, if you're able to in a, maybe like over the course of 12 weeks, you have one, two, three, you know, each one, you're, you're, you're showing what it is you can build. So maybe the first thing you demo is your data. So you demo the data that you're gonna use for your model. Maybe already in the second week, you can, de you can demo the prediction, right? And then in the third week, you, you bring it into the mobile app. And then now that you've got it in the third week, you have a computer vision model. Um, you could give it to a customer and see, does it solve their problem? Meanwhile, if you're more focused on traditional development here, you could actually have something that maybe a one year later, I've, I've seen this before, where, where you focus on something for a year and then there's still no product. And so the problem is the customer never sees it and you're focusing on building this really complex system that no one ever sees. And even though it looks like people are very busy, like it, it, if you look at all the tickets in the system, it looks like people are, are really busy, but it turns out that nothing's getting built. And so the opposite of that approach is this, this agile uh, approach for computer vision. And, and that's really why the weekly demo is so important is, 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 is really simple. Do you have something that works or not? And then if you don't, okay, let's try next week. Do you have something that works or not? Okay, it works. Okay, great. Now let's put it in front of the customer. Does a customer like it or not? If the customer doesn't like what you have, then we need to go back again. But if it takes you, in this case, it would only take you three weeks to figure out whether the customer wants it. In the other um, situation, this would take you one year to, to figure it out. So we have a huge differential between three weeks to figure out that the customer doesn't want it or one year. So this, this is called Agile here, and this is called Fake Agile. So fake agile is it looks like it's you're doing things where you have managers, you have tickets, but it, nothing's done, right? And, and, and it's a good example. And, and one of the examples of this was that uh, if you look at, in World War II, there was, um, there was some examples of uh, the, the, uh, the U.S. soldiers would go to an island and there would be, you know, some people on the island, there would be some palm trees, and they would come and they would have an airplane. 
and the airplane would come and there would be people, you know, all on the island and they would give everyone, they would give everyone food. So they would give the people that lived there who had never seen anyone else before, they would give them food. And then the, the, the U.S. soldiers never came back. And so what happened was that this island, so we'll say this is, this was the, you know, um, maybe in January of a year and then maybe uh, one year later, the, in the, we'll just call this January 1940, and then in, in the next year, what would happen is the same island is they, they would fake that they, there was a, a plane here because people wanted the food again and they developed actually their religion around this and they would call this a cargo cult. So the cargo cult is just copying literally what happened before because they think because they if they fake that the plane is coming down then they would get the food but it turns out they're just pretending that what was happening before is happening so the same thing happens with with agile is again you have you have the real agile which is that it's it's hap every week the demo is is does it work or not right and that's why i i think it's so powerful to do the one week demo, or you have the cargo cult, or you have the fake agile. And the fake agile is that people look like they're busy. There's tickets everywhere. There's there's people writing code. They're in TensorFlow. They're building all kinds of stuff. They've got maybe even you have like 10 PhDs and the 10 PhDs are hard at work, but this is actually fake. Nothing's ever happening. It Nothing ever comes out. It's just people faking that something's happening, but in a real organization, it's every week does it work, right? And so th this is really the, the core way to avoid fake stuff is you just have to ask the question that's very simple. Does it work? And, and in fact, I have a better way of, of describing this, which is this is the business value proposition, which is, is does it work? That's number one. And then, um, does anyone care? Care. So does anyone care? And then the other one is, does anyone pay? If the answer is no to any of these, then, um, you're, you this this is this is the th these are the requirements this is the business value uh, uh, triangle and if the answer to any of these is ever no then um, basically this is called failure right so so this is the part this is the real thing that people need to solve in computer vision is that um, did I make something that works does anyone care what this thing is and will anyone pay me pay me for it if you're taking one year to get to this part then you don't have a company and that's really what what the edge-based computer vision or this automail system does is it lets you focus on solving those three problems is does it work does anybody care and will they pay for it so we we, we um uh, went through this earlier, but to, to train with AutoML, you just upload it to a bucket. Many of these AutoML systems work this way. You can tell it to do multi-class classification, and then you get all these free goodies here. The even higher level, though, that, that in some cases could be a good solution as well, is you also can just use an, a pre-built API or even a combination, right? In some cases, you may want to do labeling with a vision API, but also use uh, auto auto vision uh, to to customize some some labels that you've created maybe the other thing they'll just kind of show you one more time here is that the the, the one of the big highlights of doing programming that uses a GPU is the the speed improvements and so this is a good example that shows the speed improvements I'm gonna actually double double check that um, I'm using a GPU. So this is using Colab Pro uh, GPU here. Uh, and 
we can go through here and create a fractal just like that. There we go, that's 4.7 seconds. The, um, the other one uh, is the uh, Numba Mandelbrot here. Uh, in this particular example, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna convert this code to run at assembly level using a just-in-time compiler. And so we can take that code that was pretty slow and make it 10 times faster, but it's still using the CPU. And because it's still using the CPU, we know that it doesn't do highly parallel operations. But if I use the GPU, and this particular example here goes through and it uses the GPU, um, what, what this will do is allow us to use this decorator that says at CUDA.JIT, or just-in-time compiler. And then from here, we're able to actually get it to be uh, 10 times faster again. So the, the main takeaway is that there are some ways to, to quickly test what we were talking about as well, where you can decide what, what kind of hardware solution you should use by prototyping it against the CPU, prototyping it against the GPU, prototyping it against whatever system that you have. And oftentimes that's a great way to get a, a, good, a good, ex good example project working. So, okay, so that's, that's um, the first section here. So I'm gonna go to Edge Computer. Let's go to our, go back to GitHub here and go to the next one. And go here, Edge Computer Vision. All right, so lecture two. So what are some of the emerging vision technologies that are happening right now and how could you use some of them? Well, the one of the good, uh, I guess, references is this MIT Deep Learning Basics course, which I think is a great course to go over. Uh, also, the TensorFlow Playground uh, is, a, is a great place to look. And the, the main takeaway with TensorFlow Playground is that you can play around with this code without having to worry about writing any software. And it really is helpful in, in understanding the, the nature of how a neural network works and that you can understand concepts like test loss and training loss and how to avoid overfitting, right? So in the case of training, we wanna make sure that the, the drift between the test loss and the training loss is not too high. If you have really good training and you have not as good test loss, that means you have overfitting. And then you could add techniques like let's say regularization that would go through and minimize the the drift, right? And so you can play around with those ideas and, and see how they help and also look at how different neural networks uh, work on different problem sets uh, as well. There we go. So so I think that this this is a, a good place to, to revisit frequently when you when you're if you're building something with AutoML or even building it yourself is instead of maybe spending too much time debugging it, it might be helpful to go and look at the technique that you're using with the different parameters that you're using and see will, will it even work on a simulated environment. And, and easily this might be a way to, to kind of go through and, and just check your assumptions. Uh, so I think this is a, a very good tool for that. The other um, emerging technique here is uh, generative modeling and a couple of the things that you can do with um, GANs. There's a, there's a good uh, tutorial here from Google that talks about it, but the, the main idea is that uh, a generative model can make new data instances, and so people are using this to, let's say, augment their, their training so they can add new data sets instead of having to collect uh, more data. And also with discriminative models, you can figure out the difference between different data sets. And so a generative model captures the joint probability, um, but a discriminative model captures the conditional probability. So there's a very statistical uh, approach here. Um, generative models um, can be very difficult to, to um, work with, um, but one of the, the really interesting places for this as well is to uh, figure out 
things like handwriting or faces. And, and so if you want to go into more about um, generative models, this is a good uh, overview here. And then also these um, GANs, uh, I think, are another good place to, to study up on to figure out some of the use cases for them and how people are using uh, GANs in the, in the real world. The uh, other thing that um, I think is a, is a really strong emerging uh, computer vision technology is this concept of TF Hub. And I think this is one of the places where many students should focus and they should focus on using things where they've previously found uh, most of the results and all you need to do is slightly enhance that that result uh, and what, what's great about that is that is that you're able to actually use the power of researchers who are focused on this and and you can actually uh, focus more on solving the problem versus you know going through and and um, you know building all this stuff yourself and and so in in the spirit of that there's transfer learning and with transfer learning what you can do is you can say that uh, in many cases you can actually take somebody else's work right so you can benefit from the advanced network architecture that an expert that's maybe a phd uh, researcher has developed and then you can go through and tweak this and so this is somebody else's problem and you can just slightly tweak the last component and and in this particular example you can see how uh, just a little bit of code can can enhance this. So this is, I think, s ties into some of the stuff I talked about earlier, which is that instead of building this yourself, you could focus on this business value problem. Does it work? Does anyone care? Do, does anyone pay? Right. And so if you're able to use things that are already mostly working, you can at least get this get this actually solved right and, and actually present this in front of a customer and and again what's 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 um great about this uh, is that they're they're able to actually uh, uh the customer is able to get a, a solution but you only need to do a very tiny uh, amount of of coding here by using a, a tensor a keras uh, transfer learning solution where where really you're able to actually use all of the work that someone else did in terms of the complexity of the, of the neural network and also the the training that they've spent. So they've spent a lot of money, um, you know, training some kind of a model. So that this just goes through and, and shows uh, how that how that works. The other the other example that we talked about was we got into reinforcement learning and the the key there is that with things like OpenAI Gym, you can focus on there's a agent, the agent takes an action on the environment and there's an observation and a reward. And in this particular example here, you can see that there's a cart pole um, and this cart pole is really one of the basic uh, open open AI gym things to play with but in this example here this would be a a, a scenario for training let's say pac-man and with pac-man one of the ways that you could think about training a model would be to think about some of these things like could you could you avoid ghosts could you eat the energizer pellet or another one that we know from deep racer a little bit is can we actually uh, do discovery right can we discover part of the maybe the 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 spaces that the 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 the, the, the uh, pac-man would need to go to and so this just goes through some of the the pseudo code that that you could think about building if you were going to build one of these things yourself and solve it yourself and then finally the the last answer here would would kind of walk you through uh how to how to actually build out a uh, an agent and and really in practice uh it, it's a there's a wall true loop and then you're going through and, and building out what your what your reward model looks like. So I think the be, the better one though for that is definitely going to be the um, uh, Deep Racer. And so let's just review that real quick. I think that's probably the best, you know, example of um, 
uh, of using reinforcement learning uh, in, in terms of like a commercial um, product that y that you can easily interact with. And let me just type in my two-factor auth here. <clears throat> so uh, with Deep Deep Racer. The, the big the big takeaway uh, is that it's a it's a very powerful way uh, to to learn about reinforcement learning and the, the again the, the the refresher course here is you learn reinforcement learning you create a model you train a model evaluate it and then actually place that uh, in a in a system and so if we just go through some of the basics of uh, reinforcement learning here um, if you remember there's a big difference between reinforcement learning, for example, uh, and supervised learning or unsupervised learning. Unsu unsupervised learning is really trying to figure out what are the, the relationships between things, like how do you cluster groups of things together. Supervised learning is I have got a historical data set. I want to go through and um, make it do a prediction based on the historical data. And then in terms of a reinforcement learning, is I have an agent that takes an action on an environment and the environment will um, go and give some kind of reward. And so I have this feedback loop. It's a lot like a, a, a pet. Uh, and how does Deep Racer itself drive itself? And, and, the, and the main idea here is that you're rewarding the agent. And so the big takeaway here is the agent is the car and the environment is the track and the state is where it is on the track. The actions could be steering, throttling, uh, and the reward is how much reward you give it. So when you train it, the biggest simplified version would be you want it to go straight. And so the rewards would be the highest in the middle, lower on the left, lower on the, on the right. And then if it goes off the track, there'd be no reward. But unfortunately, um, you know, you're also going to need to handle situations where it goes off the grid and you're going to have to have it train in multiple episodes so this is uh, you know an iteration it's where you go through over and over again but the but the idea here is that as you keep training it eventually it's learning how to maximize its reward and when its reward gets maximized uh, then you're able to actually figure out a reasonable solution to your model. So this is the combination of exploitation and convergence. So the exploitation is that you're trying to get a higher reward, but the convergence um, is that you're uh, is that you're able to actually figure out what is the right way to actually get to the solution. So you you need to discover the environment, and you also need to optimize for the highest reward. So those are two things that have some kind of conflict in a way, right? Because if you want to discover the shape of the track, in some cases, the highest reward may be in the short term actually counterproductive. Uh, so it's the combination of the two things that it's actually gives you the reward. Now, fortunately, in the Deep Racer environment, the reward function is a very simple Python function. And you can see that it, you've got things like position on the track, heading, waypoints, track width, distance from the center line, all wheels on track, speed, steering angle. So it's got actually a bunch of parameters that I could tweak in Python. And in particular, you can see this is the X and Y, and they describe the position of the vehicle, and they measure from the lower left corner of the environment. And so you're constantly getting this um, position that, that you can tweak out the heading, shows you what you know direction you're heading in and the waypoints are basically where you're at on the track and then the width uh, is uh, where you are in the in the uh, how far off you are from the track and then you've also got this distance from center and then is left of center wheels on track speed these are all different uh, steering angle a bunch of these different things you can tweak when you're making the function and to put it all together you get something like this, you get a reward function. So if you are interested in this applied computer vision problem, I believe that the deep racer itself is probably 
the most compelling uh, training system that you can use uh, in terms of figuring out um, how to use it and, and how to get good at, at reinforcement learning. Uh, and and I would highly recommend it. And you can see there's a couple of different examples here. You've got the stay on track one, which is slightly different. And then you've got the uh, follow center line. And then you have one that's just completely um, optimized for essentially exploration. In this case, it always returns one. As long as the car doesn't crash, it will return back one. Um, so the, if you have a chance, definitely uh, recommend that you, you dive into that. So that's um, the second section here. And then in this particular example, the, the main takeaways here would be that a lot of times a computer vision API can solve many problems. And we, we actually talked about some of these systems in here. In fact, let me just go into the code. In this repo here, you can look at things like um, a detect script here, and this is just a, a, a Bodo command line tool. Let me make that a little bit bigger. This is just a, uh, I'm sorry, a click plus Bodo command line tool that allows you to take a bucket and detect you know, something about it. Those can be really handy in, in certain situations just to build these really small little tools. Really, there's not a lot of code here with click the main takeaway is that you put a decorator on top of some code like this, uh, and then you have a label, and then uh, this is where the, the magic happens, and I make a instance of the Boto3 recognition client, and we know from earlier that I can test that out in, in recognition by just going to the recognition system, and just pasting anything I want in here. And so I can first kind of prototype out what's happening by looking at the API and you know trying things out. You know, here, here's an example of skateboarder. I can see all the different things it's detected. And then I can look, my response will look something like this, right? Where it has all the different labels on it. So that's all I'm doing here is I'm I'm doing that same thing, but I'm doing it in, in just a line of code in Python, and then I, I place in the name of the bucket. We also got into the um, lambdas here, which um, and we built this S3 lambda trigger, which I think is really also a one of the most powerful ways to be building machine learning systems right now is to think about this event-driven architecture. In particular, let's just draw that out. What is what is the event-driven uh, architecture? Is that you have some kind of cloud storage system. So let me just activate this thing real quick. So you have some kind of a of a cloud storage system, and this is a you know AWS, and here is our bucket, here's S3, and what happens is that I place an image into the bucket. So we'll say this is the image, IMG. I, I put this inside of the bucket. Maybe, maybe it's a human on my mobile phone, I'm on social media or something, liking something. I put that in there and what happens is that it generates an event. So this event will then go in and uh, call my lambda function, and my lambda is is whatever I want it to be, um, and that's what's great about this is I can tell my lambda, hey, I want you to go into this event here, and I and I want you to just listen to it, and whenever you're called, I have a piece of code here that's some Python code, and this you know we'll call this detect or something like that. This Python code will just go through and do some stuff. And then when it's done, I could put this data somewhere else. I could put it into, let's say, a key value database like this. I could say a key, key value database like DynamoDB. And then from here, Dynamo, um, the, the, what's nice about it is I could have all of the history of every single thing that's in that bucket with, with the labels, right? So this, this kind of architecture 
is could be done in a day, right? I could build this in le- I could probably build this in an hour if I wanted to, and I could uh, identify, let's say, an entire city, every event that happened in a city. And it only take me one hour to identify it. I could have a camera. It looks at people coming through, and I could just be constantly labeling those people, and and, and putting the data into a Dynamo uh, DB database. Uh, and so that's what's really nice about something like this Lambda architecture is that it's a um, rapid development tool, right? So I can rapidly solve my problem. I'm not spending, I'm not doing fake agile, right? Where I have one year and I'm building a bunch of like weird stuff that nobody knows about. This is actually something I could do in one hour. You know, I could, I could actually build this out and, and solve a problem. So that's really the other part of Agile that goes into things like microservices is, 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 a, is another important question, is how long uh, does it take to, to solve a problem? And so this is another topic that, that's related to this that, that I'll talk, in, talk about, is that this is really a good question to ask a, a software company uh, is, is uh, how long how long does it take right so you know it, it, that's one question another one is is uh what are you producing like what are what are you producing and so what what's really interesting to think about is if if you're building a factory and this factory um, is has you know inputs into it, and it has uh, outputs into it. But in the input here, in this factory, we let's just say that the input into it is is meetings, um, and then we're putting in let's say paperwork, and, and we have like maybe like. Um, uh, like, uh, you know, also d- like, uh, the, the authority you have, you have lots of, um, you know, you have to say, say nice things to your boss or something like this. If what you're putting into your factory is nothing to do with, um, building things, what, what do you, what's going to come out of your factory? You, what, what, so so what goes in is what goes out and, and, and or some version of this. And, and in, inside of your factory, what you could be building is actually producing meetings. So you have meetings that produce meetings or you have paperwork you're producing. Um, you know, it, it really it really depends. And, and the, how do you and, and, and really this is the, the key question is. What are you doing every day and how long does it take? We know in the case of the microservice, it could take one hour. So if you're not doing that, what are you doing and why are you doing it? And I think this is a really key concept for, for many people to think about is that, is that um, there's, in the case of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, most places, although I think it's a little bit different in different parts of the world, but ba- most most places you have basically 10 blocks. You have 10 blocks of work. And, and what are you doing with those 10 blocks of work? And I'll tell you what I mean by the 10 blocks. So you have two on Monday, two on Wednesday, two on Thursday. And, and each of those is equal to four hours. Right, right. So if you said eight to twelve, and then maybe you take a break and you go one to five, right? So, so you have these ten blocks. Now, how many of those blocks did you produce something? In theory, you could actually say that every week in my factory, my factory can produce. We'll build the factory again. This one's not as nice. <laughs> this is our factory. Is that? you should be able to produce 10 computer vision systems per week 
that would be I, w- I think that's a that's like a good that's a good model to 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 envision is like you have these 10 blocks if you just said every four hours i should be able to build something i should be able to build a microservice i should be able to build a computer vision model and really this is the truth serum uh, of your company and why i'm so big on the um, no code low code or microservices is that this is at a large organization that does has PhDs, has data scientists, is what are you building? And, and why can you not produce 10 things per, per week? Because more than likely, your factory is producing fake agile. Your factory is producing tickets, it's producing meetings, it's producing the manager, pleasing the other manager in your company. And so if you wanna stay in business, you have to get back down to the basics and think about speed and how speed is very important in order to have a successful company. And so I think this is really critical component that is often misunderstood is that it's easy to think about other things. Like it's easy to think about like TensorFlow, you know, deep learning, all like these are things like, so, so let's even get into further into details on this is what is important, what is not important in the case of, let's say, applied computer vision. So what is important? What is important? What is not? So what is, what's important is that you want to build 10 things a week. Okay, what's not important? Your boss, <laughs> not important, right? So what's another thing that's important is is speed, right? What, what's, what's another thing that's not important is tickets, like doesn't matter, right? What else is, is important is did you solve the, the, the business problem, right? Did somebody give you money for, for the thing you built? What, what's not important, deep learning. It doesn't matter what you used. It doesn't matter if you used um, automation or whatever, did someone pay you money? Likewise, uh, what's important is that, um, did you, do you understand that someone, does someone want it? Does anyone want it? Does anyone care? And then what is not important um, is like, uh, uh, you know, uh, PhD level research. If we're if we're talking about real world problems, not that these things are not important at some point, but if your if your goal is to build AI and ML, right? A- AI, ML, and you want to put it into production, this is what you have to be really critical on: is what's not important, what's important got to get things done you got to produce 10 things a week you got to focus on speed you got to focus on people giving you revenue so that your company can stay alive and then you're building things to solve real problems most of the time when people are building companies they're focused on they want to make their boss happy tell them how nice they are how smart their boss is they're focused on creating the appearance of work so fake agile tickets things like that also they're focused on the most complex technique they could possibly can use because it impresses people. Oh, deep learning, oh, must be good. And also they focus on like, hey, this is PhD level research. These are all, these are, at some point, these are important things. But if your goal is to produce AI or ML, these are the opposite of, of what you should work on. That's just another thing to think about. This is my opinion. Obviously, I can say this because I don't have a boss. I can be honest. But, but I think... This could change your life if you think about the 10 things each week is, are you producing 10 things each week? And if you're not, why? And most likely, if, you, if you're working for a company, it's because of one of these or, or something similar. <laughs> so something to think about. Okay, let's get into the next section here, which is uh, computer vision four which is automel so we, we basically covered that in detail 
uh, we, we don't necessarily need to get into that into much much more. Uh, and let's get into five here and get into a little bit more of the edge-based model and just kind of re recap this and why it's so important. So the, the, the world we're living, edge-based machine learning is, is huge. We, we already talked about that a bit. Low latency is a key component of it. It's available offline, privacy, uh, ASICs. We talked about Intel Movidius. So, so we basically have, have re recapped all this stuff. Some, some of the, um, the other things to mention also about uh, edge-based machine learning that maybe I'll talk about here is that, so why, why, does, why is edge becoming so, you know, why is it a big deal? Right, so so why edge, and 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 why is it that we're building edge-based systems? Well, well, one thing that we know is that the world, a, the world is different. The world changed, and so so that's one problem. B, we know that um, that automation is on the rise, so. Because automation is increasing, how, how can we increase the automation? Well, oftentimes the automation has to be localized. So one of the, one of the things about localized automation is that it's gonna be occurring, let's say in a home, it's gonna be occurring in a car, or it's gonna be occurring in a place of work uh, or a place of business, we'll just call it place of business. And so really that means that, that, that we may need to solve problems locally. And, and some of the problems that, that you would want to solve locally could include things like, um, you know, mask detection, right? Uh, that's one. We could also think about um, density, right? So, you know, how many people are in a, are in a location? We could also do... Um, edge-based prediction of disease, right? So we could, we could figure out from maybe a blood profile, um, you know, if, you're, if you have some kind of infection. We also could even look at things like the, um, the, the chest, the chest x-rays, right? So all of this stuff focuses on the fact that because the world has changed, there's even an increased focus for automation. And in order to meet the demands of this, we're going to have to move a lot quicker. And as I mentioned before, uh, the, the, big, the big question is whenever there's some kind of disruption, the, the, key, the key things uh, of a disruption are that, that, you know, a few different things about innovation and disruption is that the best thing is often not what is actually the, going to be the disruptor. A lot of times it's going to be the speed, right? And 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 also it's is it good enough? And and this is something that's called a heuristic. And so the heuristic is is basically a greedy algorithm. And a greedy algorithm uh, is like, uh, did it solve my problem? Did it solve, right? And so if, if we want to have disruption in edge-based computer vision, the speed is important. Going back to what I just talked about earlier is the 10x. Can I do 10 times? Can I put 10 models into production a day, 10 different systems? Is it good enough? And then some of the, in order to do that, though, I'm going to have to give away some things and, 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 and quit focusing on what's the best technology and focus on the speed. And as a result, what may happen is that we, we may discover how to focus on the right problem, right? And, and, and the right problem uh, oftentimes re requires a iterative feedback loop. And the iterative feedback loop is something that we all know uh, already, we use it constantly, is, is you start somewhere and you just you you slowly make it better every day, every day. And and how do we how do we see this in other this concept of kaizen? We'll call this kaizen kaizen for the edge. 
and and the kaizen for the edge is 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 what are the characteristics speed you know daily improvement um you know like uh focusing on what matters versus what someone thinks should matter and and i think the end result are the technologies that we can pick are often going to be things like auto ml uh, it will be focus on transfer learning uh, and also focus on the, the the customer right and so that that's probably the the main takeaway i would say for final projects to think about is that it's very important to think about speed when you're building things and to focus not on the technique or to focus on some other part of the problem, but going back to the business value uh, equation is, does it work? Does anyone care? Will someone pay money for it? And, and, and also, this gets into the speed factor. And if you can do this, you can really disrupt uh, the the status quo and build things that that many um, many people can't do because they're focused on the wrong problem. So this is the way to compete against very large companies or to compete against uh, other companies in your same space or competitors is is to focus on just what matters and to not uh, focus on the things that are, are are coming out of your factory that you may not be aware of. So really to to kind of summarize you know things is that the edge-based computer vision has a deep uh, integration to culture. And so you know, if, you, if you want to get AI adoption, one of the things to think about is to think about the culture. It is, is basically, it's binary. Is your culture um, good or does it need improvement? And and this is a very important one. And, and one of the best, the, the one of the best metrics, as I've mentioned before, is the truth serum is, is are you doing 10 things per week? Uh, if you're not, then maybe there's something wrong with the culture. And how can you fix this? One of the ways to fix this is to think about the Kaizen model is constant improvement, constant improvement, speed every day. And there's another way of putting this this as well, which is the, um, uh, there's a phrase from a football coach in the United States that he, he had on the front door of the, of the, the room. And, and, and basically we'll just say this is like the front door, as he said, um, are you getting getting better or are you getting worse or worse right so that's a pretty good question in general are you getting better every day or are you getting worse every day but here's here's the part that's really interesting is if you don't know you're getting worse So, so this is also goes into the concept of Kaizen, which is you got to measure, right? So, so this again goes back to that point of produce 10 things a week, use the right tools, don't focus on things that don't matter. And if you can do all these things, you could really um, solve some, some incredible problems, help the world build lots of interesting solutions. So that's probably a good stopping point for uh, what I wanted to cover. Uh, so maybe we can go into, if anyone has any questions about uh, some of the topics that, that, I, that I covered, 